All right. So as most of you have seen or heard, yesterday the dollar has reached an unprecedented level in Lebanon of 10,000 lira. And this is something that has been expected. Uh, the electricity sector is suffering where Lebanon's really facing a serious black, black, blackout throughout the, uh, 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 everywhere in Lebanon. Political assassinations have returned. The uh, deadlock in the government formation is still ongoing. People took to the streets again yesterday in Lebanon. Uh, and we are looking at different, uh, non, maybe non, not necessarily non-stop protests, but uh, on and off kind of street protests that would uh, 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 come back from time to time, every time the collapse becomes more apparent. Since October 2019, Lebanon has been experiencing the worst economic crisis in its history. With rampant inflation, coupled with growing unemployment, throwing more than half of the Lebanese people under the poverty line. Meanwhile, all efforts, including the French initiative, in, have failed to get the political class to implement reforms, even the minimal kind of reforms, or even to form a government. It would seem that Hezbollah, which is the main decision maker in Lebanon, prefers that the country stays as is and to have actually the state institutions collapse, uh, such as the Venezuela scenario that everyone is talking today about in Lebanon, instead of any kind of reforms and any change in the system. But Hezbollah faces a real dilemma here. Reform means a possible loss of control that they have gained in 2018 when they won the parliament and then the government and they got the president of their choosing. But the current collapse is also costing them their support base and the much needed access to state institutions. Faced with a lose-lose situation, Hezbollah probably was hoping for a quick US-Iran deal that would lead to fast financial relief to the party where they will have access to hard currency. And this will make them the most powerful party in Lebanon by far. But this obviously is not happening. So today they have to deal with the situation as the collapse happens fast. So what is Hezbollah planning for in the next phase of the collapse? What can we expect from the street? Are we going to see more riots, violence? What is happening today in Lebanon? How can the Biden administration respond to the people's aspirations and at the same time contain Iran's role in destroying what is left in Lebanon? And why is all that important for the international community? Today, to answer these questions, we have three great speakers from Beirut, based in Beirut. We have Makram Rabah, who is a professor at the, of history at the American University in Beirut. We have Ali Amin, who is the editor-in-chief of Janoubiya, in an online newspaper that covers Lebanon, but mainly Shia politics. And we have Alia Mansour, who is a columnist who writes about the region in general. She's based in, in Beirut, but she's also a Syria expert who will talk to us about the regional context of, of Lebanon. Um, please uh, join us in welcoming the three speakers from Beirut who are uh, we'd like to thank for joining us today. Uh, we would like to start with Makram, who will speak for 10 minutes, then Ali, and then Alia. And then we will take Q&A from, uh, from, from the audience. Uh, Makram, the floor is yours. Good afternoon uh, or good morning, depending where you are. Thank you, Hanin. It's always a pleasure to speak at the Washington Institute and uh, to interact with a lot of friends and uh, colleagues. Last time I spoke in an open forum at the Washington Institute, Luqman was with us. We spoke back in November of 2019. We were almost a month into the revolution. I was very spirited and so was Hanin. We were very uh, optimistic with what was happening. Whereas Luqman was a bit apprehensive and a bit fearful of the revolution. We were trying to make out how long would this revolution take or how, where would it take us? Uh, he had uh, these concerns and rightfully so a month into after, the, after this uh, talk we had at the Washington Institute, 
me and Luqman were attacked at our uh, tent, which is called the hub. This was a forum where we had interacted with a number of people. We had 45 lectures talking about different issues under the auspices and the patronage of the Civic Influence Hub, the CIH. Obviously, because we spoke at the Washington Institute and because of our quote unquote pro-American stance, we were targeted by Hezbollah. And this is exactly what uh, Luqman was fearful of. This is what we call the Hezbollah, the whiskey drinkers of Hezbollah, these left-wing activists who claim to be uh, fighting corruption and asking for a uh, for, for a sovereign state, but in fact, these are infiltrators and people who are uh, 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 planted by Hezbollah. The issue here is that whoever killed Luqman uh, knew well what Luqman was doing. He knew the influence that Luqman had on the ground, and more importantly, it was more of a preemptive strike. Luqman paid the price for being a very eloquent and a very outspoken critic of Hezbollah, but more so someone who was proud of his American connections, these connections were uh, were public. These connections were uh, were forged over uh, uh, large amounts of alcohol and good food in Beirut and in DC. And we never shy away from saying what we believe in. And me and Luqman and many people around this room are very outspoken, be it with the, with the Lebanese revolution or with the Syrian revolution. And this is why Luqman ultimately paid the price. If you are still wondering who killed Luqman, you're in the wrong place, guys. Uh, people who killed Luqman are people who have been uh, hijacking the state for a long time. Uh, people who are still hoping that the Biden administration will sell the pro-sovereign people down the river. Uh, it is betting on this ridiculous rhetoric that Hezbollah has a military and a political wing. It is basically as if you are trying to tell me that these people are the uh, uh, the Girl Scouts of America, and they sell cookies. They sell Thin Mints, and they sell shortbread cookies. These people are an armed, security-obsessed uh, and security-minded people whose only obsession is to stay active on the Mediterranean, as well as in different regions around the world. Luqman knew well that he will not be able to win an overnight fight, but our, uh, we were going all the way, all the way in the sense that we were refusing to allow these public spaces to be occupied by Hezbollah and more importantly, by their allies in the Lebanese government, as well as in the American government, because we had a number of diplomats that would come to Lebanon and give them the Kodak moment. Uh, we had a number of diplomats, both from the Democratic administration, as well as from Republican administration early on, that would come and sit with one of the most corrupt politicians in the history of modern Lebanon, and here I'm talking about Jubran Basile, and simply this would bring him back to the table, so to speak. We had this exercise back in 06 that every time a Western diplomat would visit Syria or would visit the region, one of us would be killed. Simply, they kill because they know that they can get away with it. They kill simply because they know that the Lebanese state cannot summon even a doorman or the coffee boy that makes coffee for Hassan Nasrullah, they can get away with it that because they don't, they don't only use silencers, but they have a whole army of cyber bullies who go after us and who make us feel uncomfortable. Maybe not me, but my entire family. And this makes you very anxious, especially that we do not do this for a living. We are not politicians. And Luqman was not a politician, neither an activist. Luqman was a publisher. And he was a person who was obsessed with the archives and preserving the history and the memory of the civil war. And this is how I knew him. Our problem is that people do not realize yet that we are still fighting two models, either the model of Hassan Nasrullah and this so-called obsession with acquiring ballistic missiles and convincing us that the only way to get out of this economic collapse is to grow potatoes in our backyard or we go towards China, and both of these options are uh, ridiculous not to say naive, or we have the option of what I call the Anrami platform. And Anrami is a, is a platform that looks like Spotify. It's a spot, Arabic Spotify. These people opened in 2012, and these people are now valued at 120 million. Okay, recently they had to leave. They left to the UAE, to the United Arab Republic, because simply it was no longer an option to do business. If these guys actually walk to Nasrallah and tell him that you need to cool it down because we cannot do business, most probably he will tell them that you need 
to fight the good fight because we want to destroy and throw the Jews and the Israelis into the sea. And he would suggest that these same people who have developed this very fine interactive uh, uh, music, Arabic music platform to go and sell uh, pirated uh, DVDs on some intersection. This is, these are the people that we are dealing with. If it comes to me, yesterday David Schenker gave a very good uh, talk to, to Arabia, and he said that the maximum pressure campaign is not being conducted by the United States, which I agree with. The maximum pressure campaign is being conducted by the militias of Iran, be it in Ma'rib, be it in Saudi Arabia, be it in Lebanon through the killing of Luqman, and but what they are doing in different parts of Syria. Simply, we cannot back away from this fight. So far, the Biden administration has been clear that it will not replicate the Obama model, which is fine, because simply, I actually don't care to convince you that you should do what's good for Lebanon. You should do what's good for the US. What's good for the US is not to allow impunity. It's not good to allow good people such as Luqman, people who believe, believe in the liberal arts education and liberal arts value, to be executed in the south of Lebanon after a long night of drinking. To add insult to injury, we've been months into the killing of Luqman and the Lebanese state has done nothing. It has just been able to bully us and try to convince us that they are trying to investigate, to try to find out who killed Luqman. We already know who killed Luqman. Whoever killed Luqman is the same person who killed Rafi al-Hariri and who killed tens of other people and who has went into Syria and tried to convince us that they are fighting ISIS while in fact they are butchering innocent Syrians and innocent civilians and kids and women. If Luqman was here, he would actually have used the quote behind me, which is justice even if the heavens fall. Al-Adil hatta law saqat al-sama. And Sayyid Ali Amin was telling me that you are optimistic. I am not optimistic. You cannot be a friend of Luqman and actually, uh, sorry, be pessimistic. You cannot be a pessimist if you know Luqman's sleep. We have been fighting these hoodlums and here the hoodlums are not only Hezbollah and people usually come to me and tell me, why are you obsessed with Hezbollah? Why do you only talk about Hezbollah? Actually, they don't listen to what we say. Me, Ali, Hanin, Ali, and all these people, we say that Hezbollah is part of the problem because Hezbollah has a militia that provides cover and security and protection for the people who are uh, embezzling the resources of the state. Uh, Hanin started off by telling you about the terrible living conditions. My salary at UB is 60 million Lebanese pounds, which is for someone who teaches history, it's around $5,000. And this is so far. So in the next couple of weeks, maybe uh, this will not be enough for me even to uh, pump gas into my car. The problem is not about is not financial. The reason why I talk about Hezbollah because I cannot be talking about uh, uh, basically the immigration of birds. I cannot be talking about the lack of water, which is also a problem. But the problem here is that Hassan Nasrullah is trying to convince us that what he's doing is normal and turning Lebanon into a Spartan state and an open state of warfare, not with Israel, because for me, he's protecting actually the northern border of Israel. He's actually an open war with the Gulf the Arabs, and more importantly, with the Lebanese themselves. He can kill us, he can bully us, he can make us starve, but simply he cannot convince us that his model is normal. Whatever you want to say about it, what the Biden administration should do is simply call them out. What the Biden administration should do, and this is something which I was attacked on, that I was inviting sanctions against the Lebanese. Yes, I ask any policymaker, be it American, European, Chinese, or from Mars, to continue sanctioning not Hezbollah. Hezbollah is trivial in this sense for the fact that Hezbollah is a non-state actor which lives like a, a mafia. It, 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 it runs a racketeering business and it can acquire money illicitly. However, the people who claim to be statesmen, people like Lebron Basile and the rest of the Lebanese political elite, and here I mean all of them, I'm not signaling out anyone. The Magnitsky Act is a very good approach and we have to thank our friends in the former administration. However, I would like to remind you that all of you or the DC crowd were obsessed with Jamal Khashoggi and they decided to name actually, I think around DuPont. Jamal Khashoggi is no different from Luqman Slim. And because I know Luqman personally, 
and uh, please uh, accept this. I think that Luqman is much important than Jamal. Jamal did not have the intellectual package that Luqman has, and certainly Jamal Khashoggi is not a Western oriented and a Western enlightened thinker. Luqman's case should be treated equally like Khashoggi. We already know who killed Khashoggi and we are still trying to get justice for, at least Khashoggi will get justice because his killers ultimately admitted what they did. However, the killers of Luqman should be sanctioned for corruption, they should be sanctioned for racketeering, and they should be sanctioned for the killers that they are. The people that killed Luqman did not silence him with six bullets, five to the back and one to the head. They silenced him by convincing people that Luqman is a radical, that Luqman is inviting sanctions, and that Luqman actually wants to target, physically target Hezbollah. Luqman was simply drawing to the simple fact that we cannot allow Hezbollah and this pol political class to become normal. Although they have been able to destroy Lebanon, although they were able to turn uh, one of the greatest countries, I think, with ed education and healthcare and uh, a, a lot of good food into a cesspool. Remember, whatever whoever is in the White House, be it, be it a Republican or a Democratic president, what's important is not to allow people to walk over you and basically sell the Lebanese down the river because simply your investment in Lebanon has been, uh, been happening since the 80s and even before. And I teach a course to my students at UB about American, um, the United States and the Middle East. You have to continue using soft power. You should continue providing us with the safety net. Uh, here, I'm not talking about the institutions which don't exist. I'm talking about the people of Lebanon. And most importantly, go for the kill. The kill is sanctioning these murderers and these corrupt politicians who allow Hezbollah to sit at the cabinet table and act as if they were policymakers, while in fact they are simple hoodlums which only drink the blood of the Lebanese people as well as the people of the area. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Makram. Uh, I will come back to you with a question after all the speakers are done. And I'm sure uh, everybody's looking forward to hear from Ali uh, on the uh, Hezbollah intra Shia dynamics. Uh, uh, go ahead, Ali. Just remember uh, that yeah, translation is available for Ali. Uh, thank you, uh, Hanin, and thank you all the participants uh, in this meeting. And uh, I may start by stressing and uh, echoing everything that has been stated uh, by my colleague Makram, uh, especially in uh, relation to the issue of the assassination of uh, Luqman, uh, because dealing with this case will be an indicator of uh, how uh, Lebanon will be dealt with in general. And uh, I start from w where my colleague ended, and they would like to say that uh, Lebanon is uh, in, in the midst uh, of uh, almost a full collapse. Uh, it is uh, still counting you know, on the role of military and security forces as a leverage to prevent uh, the full collapse. After the uh, resounding collapse of the currency, the business, the economy, the health, uh, the education, the utilities, the livelihoods, the foodstuffs and everything. But all that, and despite uh, this uh, very serious scene, still uh, the scenario of the uh, civil war is uh, eliminated. Uh, uh, despite all the differences in Lebanon, I believe that everyone is refusing uh, war to be back. Uh, not only because they are not sure of winning it, but because they cannot bear the consequences of, of it. Number two, uh, yes, uh, the security uh, situation is worrying uh, and it is appalling. There are thefts, attacks. Uh, sectarian and political uh, frictions, but it is not uh, up to the level of uh, being a civil war. The uh, political settlements uh, are possible, are likely, uh, especially the uh, American-Iranian uh, deals uh, on, uh, on Lebanon. Uh, and uh, sadly, any uh, future deal, we believe, will uh, reproduce the existing 
uh, the existing class uh, or regime and will reproduce Hezbollah and his allies. And this is a fact. There are a number of reasons for this uh, fact. Number uh, one, uh, the uh, revolution uh, of uh, November in Lebanon failed uh, in establishing a charismatic leadership from all factions and sects. Uh, number two, uh, Hezbollah is covering uh, this uh, sectarian regime because it does not uh, have a uh, political uh, Lebanese uh, project. It has a regional approach. And the ideology of Hezbollah uh, did not reconcile with the concept of the uh, civic state. And therefore, Hezbollah is closer to the sectarian policies than uh, to the uh, civil approaches. And number four, the Lebanese national identity is not yet mature, although 40% of the uh, Lebanese uh, are uh, adopting an affiliation that is beyond sectarianism. And this is a very important figure and it can change the balance of forces uh, with, the, uh, with the elite and the class that is ruling the country. Uh, but uh, there is no historical background uh, for uh, the national identity uh, to be forged uh, and to uh, cover everything. In uh, conclusion, I believe that uh, there will be uh, likely some regional and international deals and they will re reproduce the uh, sectarian uh, regime or system. But uh, there is hope that started uh, in 2005 and then in 2019 and uh, still we are trying to find a champion uh, to lead us. Uh, if uh, we uh, can be optimistic, uh, let's remember the quote that uh, history is the uh, sum of the uh, long-term hopes, uh, not the short-term events, uh, wars, or epidemics. And the long-term hopes of Lebanon has started, and we uh, just uh, need uh, some luck and some champions to lead it. Very briefly, I will address the impact of the killing of uh, Luqman Slim and uh, the uh, speech uh, of uh, Patriarch Bishar uh, a few days ago on uh, concerning the uh, Shia environment or context. The assassination of uh, Luqman Slim uh, less than a month ago uh, instilled uh, in uh, the uh, Shia uh, minds uh, the fear uh, and uh, people are now hesitant and are afraid of expressing their opinions. Uh, now, uh, people are very hesitant uh, to express themselves. And if there are uh, people with different opinions, they will hide their opinions. And the uh, Shia uh, opposition uh, leaders or those who uh, are within the Shia community and they are opposed to certain policies, uh, they will uh, find a very strong resistance against them. And many of them will be hesitant and will be uh, fearful of the uh, consequences. Uh, the uh, speech of uh, Patriarch Bishar Ra'i will not find its way uh, to the uh, Shia community because of the complete closure and the obstructions and the prevention of the delivery of information to the people in the Shia community. Uh, there is separation between the uh, Shia community and the context and the environment. And therefore, the uh, message of uh, Patriarch uh, will uh, reach them probably, but distorted and uh, it will be uh, different. And. Uh, the uh, dynamism within uh, the uh, Shia community uh, is not there. There is no open discussion. Uh, there is resentment within the Shia community, yes, but uh, it has not yet created a momentum uh, because of the dominance of uh, Hezbollah and the policy of fears that Hezbollah is adopting. Probably the only way to achieve an internal change is to have a competitive power that grows and emerges with uh, media and international relations so it can face the de facto forces or maybe some dramatic events could happen 
that are related uh, to the uh, regional coalitions, especially in Syria, or things inside the country may uh, reach to the point of being out of control. In brief, uh, the uh, situation within the Shia community is closed now. And the hierarchy that is created by Amal and Hezbollah, which is led by Hezbollah within this community, has not exhausted its purposes and energies yet. And this is putting the future of Lebanon at risk and the situation in Lebanon will remain a hostage for the Iranian interventions come back to you as well with more questions later about the Shia community per se, but would like to hear from Alia now uh, about the regional perspective and Lebanon in the context of the region, especially Syria and, and, and Iran in general. Go ahead. You are muted. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, as I see the problem in, of uh, Lebanon, it, it's part of a regional problem which many countries controlled by Iran are suffering from. The collapse is in Lebanon is also happening in Iraq and in Syria, even if it has different characteristics in each country and appears to be more complicated in Lebanon and more bloody in Syria. But it is Iran's agenda. Uh, it's based on destroying the concept of the state itself in, in favor of the concept of militias, especially in Lebanon, where Hezbollah is Iran's spoiled uh, baby. In my opinion, the 17 October movement made a, a mistake. Uh, many of the groups participated made a mistake, but by not noticing the complexity of Lebanon's problem. Corruption is wide, uh, widely spread in institution, but it cannot be fought without fighting its main Cause, which is the absence of the state in favor of militia. Some, some, uh, some of them tried to neutralize the issue of weapons and of Hezbollah from the movement's demands, but they did not answer the simple question, which is how can you fight corruption if you cannot yeah, simply control your borders, which results in smuggling and all what, uh, what happens there. Where you can, where you can, when you can extend the state authority, it, it would become easier to hold the remaining corrupt accountable. But if you could not, then the whole issue would take a sectarian dimension. Why, would, why uh, should we fight the corruption of the Sunnis if we cannot fight, uh, fight the corruption of the Shia? Why hold the Druze accountable if the Christians' officials are a red line? Things are connected and complicated. And the solution start by finding a solution to the issue of the arms, the, the issue of the militia. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not just a Lebanese problem. It is a regional problem. Anything other than that, it's a partial solution, in my opinion, that does not cure the main cause of the issue. Uh, we see on daily basis repetition of the saying, Hezbollah is silent on the corruption of others in exchange of their silence of its weapons. And this is false and dangerous to keep repeating it uh, because it indicates, uh, ind indicates that Hezbollah itself is not corrupt. While we should, by now, everyone knows that it, it is corrupted from uh, selling uh, false medicine to uh, controlling legal and illegal borders, to the tax evasion, to the money laundering and drug dealing. Hezbollah has been murdering the Lebanese and the Syrians for years. And they started with the Lebanese in 2005 and maybe years er earlier. And now they have been killing the Syrians for uh, four years now. Until now, we honestly could not feel that there is a serious act against them. And by serious, I mean making them pay for what they did and not just give them with their partners a new chance waiting for them to change their, their behavior. And honestly, with Biden administration, I don't think we can be very optimistic about this and I hope I'm wrong. All right. All right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to ask each of you a question and then I would like uh, to uh, ask the audience again if they want to uh, ask a question, you can use the chat box 
the Q&A, sorry, the Q&A box in the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A icon, you can click on it and write your question. Uh, if uh, uh, you are on live stream, you can send your questions to uh, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org and I will collect all the questions and convey them to the uh, speakers. Uh, so please let me know if you have any questions. But while you do that, I would like to start with Makram. Uh, from your talk, uh, it's not looking good. You said you are not pessimistic, but what you said is actually the way you describe the situation doesn't look good at all. With the current situation, things are going to get worse. Uh, that's that's basically what we're expecting is worse uh, political, economic, security collapse as well. So we're looking at more security incidents, internal security incidents, and this is where I still wonder. What is Hezbollah plan ahead of that? So are they going to interfere again in turning the and in, in, in um, uh, cracking on the protesters like they did in the in the past wave of the protests? Are they going to continue political assassination? Uh, what is the role of the security institutions, especially the Lebanese army, in this sense? Uh, we know that the 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 uh, um, the situation, the economic situation, is also hitting the uh, people within the security institutions. The salary of a, a, a Lebanese army soldier is now reduced from, I don't know, $1,000 to $100, and it's going to get worse. How is this soldier going to deal with the security situations when they are asked to go and face the protesters themselves? So what is going to happen when really things go out of hand with more riots, more violence? And we saw in Tripoli that what happened is that they 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 are now charging the protesters who participated in the Tripoli uh, protests last time with terrorism charges. And that is very dangerous precedence. You know, like if you go to the street, now you are considered a terrorist. So what is the uh, army and other security institutions uh, uh, role, especially that basically the international community, especially the US, they have some kind of leverage within these security institutions in terms of aid, whether the Europeans with security forces or the US with the army. So what leverage can be used? What are the tools that can be used? Can this be controlled in a way? And in general, how Hezbollah is going to deal with this whole situation when we hear a lot of talk about Hezbollah pushing actually for more collapse in order for them to change the system from whatever Ta'if implemented or like needs to be implemented from Ta'if to something new with more, with a different kind of power sharing where the Shia will have more uh, share in the parliament instead of, of, of the current uh, half Christian, half, 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 half Muslim uh, share. So this is a question for you. Uh, Ali, um, I think what I understood also from your uh, talk is that the Shia community really is isolated and there's no hope of whether there's discontent, the growing discontent, uh, everything that is happening uh, uh, within the Shia community, the signs of discontent within the Shia community um, is not going to change anything because Hezbollah is making sure that they are isolating this discontent. But at the end of the day, this is, is this going to have any influence on Hezbollah within the community? Is this going to push Hezbollah to deal with the Shia in a different way? Is it going to change uh, uh, the support base from uh, loyalty and love for Hezbollah and the resistance, whatever, to, to, to more fear and uh, uh, more isolation? Um, uh, Alia, uh, my question for you is the connection really, like how do you see the connection between Lebanon and Syria in two ways? One, the collapse of the economies mm -hmm. happening simultaneously at the same time is interesting. So why is this happening? Uh, how is Syria uh, benefiting also from the, 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 still until today, there is a lot of smuggling going from Lebanon to Syria. So can you tell us a little bit about the smuggling? What are the uh, Lebanese or Hezbollah taking to Syria and how is the, the uh, regime involved in all that? And can you tell us a little bit also about this, all reports coming from different sources about the Syrian regime involvement in the uh, Beirut blast? 
uh, the, the nitrates that came to Beirut through Hezbollah that were going to be used in Syria for, for bombs. So uh, this, these links, the security, the economy, the, 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 the political links between the two regimes, how do you see this evolving? Uh, how do you see this impacting both Hezbollah in Lebanon and the regime in Syria and Iran in the region? Uh, I know this is like uh, maybe a one hour discussion, but if you can like uh, summarize uh, uh, this in, in a short answer. And uh, let's start with Makram. Makram, you're muted. Okay. Can you yeah, I just did. So if anyone is under any delusion, the real enemy of Hezbollah in Lebanon is not the political establishment. Neither is Israel. The real fear that Hezbollah has is against the revolution. Every time uh, they try to hijack the revolution like they did on the 17th of October, or just like they did yesterday by allowing their Shiite, uh, Shiite base, so to speak, to riot against uh, demand for electricity. This is not about electricity. And Hezbollah doesn't do politics. Hezbollah does politics on his spare time. It's, he does politics as a hobby. Uh, he is going after the revolution. And one of the major sins of the revolution is basically not uh, calling the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is Hezbollah. And as long as we do not acknowledge this and face this elephant, we are done for. Actually, Lebanon is, uh, is, is finished. Lebanon is finished because they're even going after institutions such as the institution I work for. They don't like to see the American University of Beirut or the Jesuit University or any of the institutions which stood by the revolution and said that you need to reform or you need to leave. Simply Hezbollah will keep killing and then ask questions later. And I told you why, because no one could hold them accountable and because this is the only thing they know how to do. Nasrallah was quick to accuse us of being agents of the different embassies. And you don't need to read Nasrallah, you read his uh, his toilet paper of newspapers, and here I'm talking about Akbar, which call us agents, and these people and their, uh, their, their mouthpieces are people who eulogize bin Laden. If you had, didn't read the eulogy of Ibrahim al-Amin when, uh, when he cried over bin Laden, you should. And you should definitely read uh, when uh, he was uh, treading over Luqman's grave and justifying why Luqman's killing was okay. What should happen, and this is something we, we've been talking about for ages, is that this revolution should be decentralized and this revolution should not have names or heads. When you are branded as a leader of the revolution, you are put on a hit list. And this is exactly what they did by using the different security apparatuses and the different agencies in Lebanon. The decentralization of the security profession in Lebanon. You mentioned, Hanin, that the Lebanese army. Lebanese army is good. For me, as a former basketball player, I use the Lebanese army to box out Hezbollah. We want distance, social distancing in a way. We don't want Hezbollah to come closer, but we cannot take them on on an open battlefield. The martyr square is too big for us. We need to go to the regions. We need to go to the diaspora. And more importantly, and this is something that Alia can talk about, go after Assad and make them hurt. The, the, the collapse of the Lebanese economy has to do with the fact that Assad and his goons were embezzling our money, our dollars, and the whole Ponzi scheme, which Riyad Salem and all of these people were part of. And unfortunately, the majority of the Lebanese put their money in banks for 15% return on investment. This is a Ponzi scheme. A drug dealer doesn't make an, this much money. And we deserve losing this because we trusted a banking system which turned into uh, uh, simple, uh, they're, they're loan sharks in a way. And now they're trying to convince us that simple cosmetic uh, uh, measures can, uh, can jumpstart this economy. This economy is done for, and I, got, I have reached the conclusion, the personal conclusion that you should not allow anyone to rebuild this temple using the same stones. This doesn't mean that we don't, Lebanon, don't want Lebanon that we call for, but simply we should not allow these masons to build them and not use the same building blocks. These building blocks are radioactive. And to go back to the main idea, we should make these politicians radioactive. We should make the people of Lebanon not come close to these people because they should pay 
for their support of this clientelist system and this support for these warlords and for these people who go as far as Yemen to kill and wreak destruction. Thank you. Uh, Ali, please. Uh, uh, I will summarize uh, for, for the live stream. For the live stream, people, I will summarize in Arabic. Later. Sorry, I'm just saying for the live stream, people, I will summarize everything that Ali said in, in English later. Go ahead. Tfaddal, Ali, tfaddal. I want to say that uh, the question uh, here uh, opens uh, the door for a lot of things to be uh, said. Uh, I'll uh, try to be uh, brief uh, uh, in order to uh, convey the idea. I want to say here that uh, first of all, we have to examine the history and uh, first of all the uh, shia community and uh, if everyone uh, follows up on that uh, you know that the shia community uh, be it in lebanon or in other uh, countries uh, it is a diverse community it means that the uh, shia ideology is based on some key notions uh, which is the ijtihad the uh, innovation and creativity and this uh, means the diversity the different uh, opinions uh, the uh, pluralism uh, this is the nature the historical nature of the uh, shia community and i'm um, talking about uh, lebanon uh, here since uh, the emergence of uh, Lebanon, the Shia community was diverse and it was not one block. It was not uh, under one uh, leader or it was not uh, captivated uh, by a single uh, movement. Uh, but then uh, since uh, decades, uh, we have had yeah. uh, politicization of religion in Lebanon. Uh, and they uh, tried uh, to dominate uh, the religious uh, discourse uh, and they have uh, managed to dominate the religious uh, discourse uh, discourse for the Shia community and they have used money and the security institution to exercise control. They have had past wars with Amal movement and the uh, Hezbollah uh, team which is representing the Iranian uh, presence. They have conducted some assassinations uh, in the 80s, starting from the 80s. They have assassinated uh, people having some leftist uh, ideas uh, or uh, patriotic uh, ideas, people who uh, were diverse in the Shia community. So they have tried to quell them. And the Syrian regime supported uh, this uh, ideology and this approach. It was very violent after 2005. They uh, have uh, controlled, they have taken advantage of uh, the uh, departure of the uh, Syrian army from Lebanon and they have dominated the country. Uh, there is a kind of resistance. Uh, the resistance, uh, I'm not meaning here the resistance to the Israeli occupation. The resistance to Israel started from before Hezbollah emerges uh, and uh, the resistance uh, before Hezbollah achieved uh, some gains. Uh, so the uh, Shia community is diverse and we should not uh, blame them for what is uh, happening. There is a kind of monopoly of the resistance uh, against Israel by Hezbollah and the Iranian regime in order to boost the image of uh, Hezbollah. Hezbollah invested uh, in the uh, sectarian game uh, and it uh, reinforced its uh, dominance uh, by uh, weapons, uh, by the execution of others, uh, by uh, the uh, military and security influence it uh, has. The, uh, has. All this led uh, to the situation we are uh, in. And a key point that uh, also uh, added uh, fuel to this uh, isolation is the engagement of in wars in uh, Syria and in other parts of the Arab world. Uh, 
Hezbollah has adopted uh, the approach of uh, frightening people. Uh, Hezbollah is uh, portraying the war in Syria as a war against the uh, Sunnis and that the uh, Shia are uh, besieged by uh, Israel and by uh, Syria, which is uh, predominantly uh, Sunni, and uh, by others. And therefore, uh, Hezbollah is uh, telling his supporters that all uh, other parties are trying to attack you. And here it is uh, instilling fear, fear mongering. And uh, here uh, the common uh, Shia person will say, that they have no option. If uh, Hezbollah collapses, what could be the alternative? Uh, this is a logical question within the Shia community. If uh, Hezbollah collapses, uh, okay, uh, we will be as a Shia community in the Lebanese state. And all this uh, does not mean that uh, Hezbollah is uh, fully dominating the Shia community. I believe we have uh, seen recently some movements within the uh, Shia community and uh, in the uh, Shia regions or areas we have uh, seen some uh, brave uh, people who criticized uh, Hezbollah and uh, uh, the Hezbollah and Amal yeah. movements. Amal is the weak party in this uh, partnership. Hezbollah is uh, leading uh, Amal. Uh, uh, Hezbollah is using Amal movement for uh, its uh, benefit. And therefore, the uh, Shia community uh, today is worried because of the economic crisis, because of the finance of the country. Uh, Hezbollah has a base of uh, support, but it represents probably 15 to 20 percent of the uh, community about 80 percent of the shia community they are not benefiting from what is happening in the country uh, on the other hand they are suffering because of the collapse and because of the currency and other factors the economic collapse in the country which caused the closure of businesses and institutions there is a real crisis but uh, this resentment has not yet reached the level that it threatens hezbollah the assassination of Luqman Slim, I believe one of the objectives of this assassination is to send a message to the uh, Shia community, not to the Christians, not to other uh, sects or to the uh, Lebanese at large. No, the key message was to the Shia community to tell them uh, that you cannot resist. Uh, I think this uh, message uh, was delivered. The message was uh, delivered uh, at least uh, temporarily because it created a kind of fears. The uh, fears we have uh, seen after the assassination of Luqman Slim. We have seen how the state institutions and judiciary dealt with this assassination. All this uh, provided uh, Hezbollah was, uh, with a leverage to send a message to the uh, Shia community to say to them that even Luqman Slim who had uh, very uh, unique connections in comparison to others. Uh, he uh, had European and American connections and he had influence. He could be killed and there will be uh, no serious uh, response from the institutions or the judiciary to this crime. And this uh, serves a, an objective. I mean, they have delivered this message, I believe. I believe that uh, Hezbollah now is not in its uh, best uh, situations. When Hezbollah is using assassinations, this is a sign of weakness. The uh, terrorizing of others and terrorizing of people is a sign of weakness. And if, th if things uh, continue as they are, I believe that uh, we will see uh, some uh, chaos in the country and havoc uh, and uh, but probably this will not lead to a complete transformation unless there are regional and international developments to help in this respect thank you
simultaneous translation within the Zoom. Uh, everybody under heard him in English, but there are some people on the live stream that I just to, to summarize this. Um, uh, Ali thinks that the Shia community historically is very diverse, and that's based on the concept of al ishtihad uh, within the uh, Shia theology. And Iran has controlled re religious platforms, mainly when they came to Lebanon. Uh, but not only that, they also used money and arms and started the assassinations in the 80s. Not, not this is not recent. They started the assassina assassinations as soon as Iran formed uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Um, eventually, this evolved, and like when when uh, when the Syria uh, revolution broke and then Hezbollah got involved, more involved in the region and their and their regional role grew, they started to use the factor of fear of the Sunnis in, in Syria and the rest of the region. So in addition to everything they've done in Lebanon, the other tool is really like the factor of fear of the others, uh, uh, the, the Sunnis in general in the region, but mainly in Syria. Today, with all these factors and layers that uh, Iran and Hezbollah has employed in Lebanon, the Shia today ask, they have, the discontent is growing, but they are asking today, what's really the alternative? If we do not have Hezbollah, who is going to help us? Who is going to protect us? Especially that Hezbollah managed to destroy state institutions. So the Lebanese state is not really the alternative. Uh, so yes, the Shia today are afraid, they're concerned about the future, they are suffering from economy and collapse, and they're showing signs of discontent, but this still is not too threatening for Hezbollah, but it might be. And that's why uh, Ali uh, wanted to bring up again the issue of the assassination of Luqman Slim, and he thinks that this is mainly uh, because of uh, a mainly a message to the Shia community who were showing many signs of discontent recently, and for the Shia community to understand that any sign of uh, discontent is going to be met with violence. But this is also a sign of, of fear, and this is a sign of weakness on behalf of Hezbollah and it needs to be utilized not only in Lebanon, but in any regional development. Keep in mind that Hezbollah is feeling also the fear and the weakness. Um, this is just a summary of, of, of well, what Ali said. And now I would like Alia to just answer briefly my question before we move to the q and I, uh, uh, I have a list of questions already in the chat box, in the Q&A box. So I will be asking them as soon as Alia uh, answers us. Please go ahead. Okay, first let me uh, let me uh, comment on what uh, my friend Makram said about Lebanon is finished. The region is finished, dear Makram. Uh, yesterday they were destroying uh, 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 a very old and heritage uh, coffee shop in Damascus. Just for the Iranians, they want the land to build their own project, their own touristic place uh, uh, on it. Uh, 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 Hanin, you were asking about uh, 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 the collapse yesterday. Uh, the lira, the Syrian lira, uh, reached for uh, the dollar reached four thousand liras. At the same time, it was reaching ten thousand here. It's it, and it is uh, the same collapse happening, and it is uh, the Caesar Act. We we cannot forget the Caesar. Yes, it is affecting them. And Bashar al-Assad said a few weeks ago that uh, he blamed the Lebanese for not being able to to get the dollars from Lebanon. He's saying he was taking the dollars and he was uh, doing with his businessmen. And we don't forget that this uh, uh, Lebanese government gave uh, uh, the Lebanese nationality to those corrupted uh, Syrian businessmen. So they uh, they make it easier for them to, to do the money laundry and to finance the Syrian regime uh, criminal acts in Syria. Uh, concerning the, the, what happened in, in Beirut uh, in August, they don't believe, the Iranians don't believe we are states. They, mentioned, they say it publicly many times, from Tehran to Baghdad to Damascus to Beirut, it is their region. That's why we don't, you know, what happened in, in Beirut, it is related to what was happening in Syria, and Luqman talked about it before he was assassinated. They were using the Lebanese uh, uh, port to, to uh, uh, import some uh, TNT and many different, uh, I don't know, the chemical names for uh, their bombs. And they were using it to kill the Syrian people. And 
what happened is that they did not use this shipment, all of uh, of the uh, shipment, and uh, it exploded. How? I don't know. And they are not willing. Hezbollah, Nasrallah was very clear about it. They are not willing for any real investigations. Khalas, we killed you. Uh, uh, open a new page and uh, forget about it. They don't believe. I don't think we can uh, find a solution to Hezbollah and mainly to the Iranians militia in Lebanon without finding a solution in Syria and in Iraq. It's a chain. We have to work on all levels, not just in Lebanon. Yeah, and that's why I don't. Yeah, I don't feel any solutions will be with the French initiative. It's a kind of uh, giving Panadol to a cancer. Uh, uh, yeah, someone, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this this brings me to to a really important issue, and I urge all the speaker to give it a thought while we're answering the other. Uh, just maybe for concluding remarks, is um, there's a big question today, you know, with the for for the for the U.S. and the international community in general in in Lebanon's policy. Do we dissociate? Lebanon's policy from Iran's policy, or do you think that uh, Lebanon's policy should be part of Iran's policy, or maybe should there be separate policies, one for Lebanon and one for Hezbollah? Like, do you think this is something that should be, like Alia, you seem to be thinking that it should be one and the same. I would like to hear from uh, Makram and Ali about that. But that's for your concluding remarks, just, just a big uh, question. I would like to start taking questions from the audience. Uh, I'll try my best to, to, to get everyone. Uh, there's a question about the Shia community being prevented from getting information. Do you think, Ali, that the Shia community is being prevented from getting information? Uh, or do they have access to, to, to the information? Is it catered for them? What, what, do, what do you think? Uh, I'll take another question. Uh, yeah, no. yeah, go ahead, go ahead. It's fine. Go ahead. Mm. Uh, Absolutely, uh, the uh, Shia community is uh, lacking any different uh, platforms uh, than uh, Hezbollah. All uh, the mobilization, the religious, ideological and political mobilization is taking place from platforms that are loyal to Hezbollah. The religious councils, the Islamic Council, for example. The Islamic Council is diverse by its concept, but it is confiscated by Hezbollah. And therefore, all the religious platforms and all the voices in the Shia community are with Hezbollah. And if there is any different voice, it is threatened and intimidated. We have seen some examples in the past of people who were banished, uh, uh, terrified and silenced. Uh, people uh, were silenced. Uh, and therefore, the uh, single interpretation and single opinion comes from uh, Hezbollah and from the platforms of uh, Hezbollah. And uh, in my opinion, media may not have a big impact uh, here. But even with the media, probably you have seen recently that in some areas when uh, certain programs were uh, broadcast, a program for Dima Sadiq, a show for Dima Sadiq, she accused Hezbollah of killing Luqman Slim, and Dima Sadiq, uh, she is Lebanese, and she is also a Shia person, when she spoke uh, on uh, MTV and accused Hezbollah of killing Luqman Slim, uh, her show was closed or uh, this TV uh, station was banned in uh, areas controlled by Hezbollah, the uh, Shia areas uh, and Al Jadid TV, which is originally closed to Hezbollah, not uh, far away from Hezbollah, but uh, even this very small margin of freedom that used to exist, uh, that uh, TV expressed uh, a certain opinion that Hezbollah did not like, and therefore they banned it in areas they control. So this is just an example, although this is against the law, of course, uh, but uh, this is happening. Uh, and this is less important uh, than 
the overall uh, practices of uh, Hezbollah, which is the isolation of the uh, Shia community uh, and at the, level, at the political level, religious level, and uh, the official level. Everything is uh, confiscated by Hezbollah. Okay, uh, so short short answer to this question is, uh, uh, yeah, it's very difficult for the Shia to access information, especially we have certain examples of, of certain Lebanese local news that uh, TVs that have been uh, uh, the access to certain uh, news TV uh, channels have been cut in Dahi, the southern suburbs of Beirut, for example, or in Shia areas. They, uh, they, it's becoming more and more and more difficult for the Shia community to access uh, certain information, especially when Hezbollah makes sure that that uh, um, they attack and discredit everything that is against them. So it's it's becoming even harder. Uh, but this is nothing compared to everything else that Hezbollah is doing on terms of cultural, religious, and uh, uh, like the the. The control is not just through the news, it's through cultural institutions, religious institutions, and all the platforms. So this is something that uh, is soft power they have that needs to be addressed. Um, I will take the next question. And uh, I would like the speakers to be brief because we have um, a lot of questions and I'd like to cover, to cover them all if we can. Uh, so we have a question about, um, uh, opposition formation. So do you, I think this is more for Makram. Do you see any hope for the formation of an opposition front to confront the mafia militia control of the country and to coordinate actions, protests, political programs, elections? And what is preventing this unity from happening? Also, is it true that the Sunni community today is rallying behind Saad al-Hariri and his alliance with Hezbollah and away from the revolution? Uh, Makram, if you can briefly answer this yeah. question. Uh, simply, there is a front being uh, formed. However, the major problem is ego. Ego, because many of the people, including I saw a question here, people believe that we can change through elections. Come on, guys. We have our own Nancy Pelosi. His name is Nabil Birri. Even if you get the majority of the parliament, and ironically, we have had the majority for ages. But the last time March 14 won the election, we were prevented from voting. You're not allowed to vote unless you vote for Hezbollah's guys. And ultimately, if anyone here thinks that we can win an election that is rigged by the fact that there's gerrymandering of the electoral law, and more importantly, people cannot go and vote because in Hezbollah-controlled areas, the electoral uh, screen does not exist. If you are not a loyal supporter of Hezbollah, you are not allowed to leave your premise to go vote. This is very important. And more importantly here, I think, that the traditional political parties who are not part of the corrupt political class. And here, uh, if I may, the Lebanese forces and the Kata'ib, the Lebanese forces are guilty of helping uh, Michel Aoun get to power. However, they are not implicated in corruption. This, they, and I know that Joe now will, uh, will go after me by trying to defend what uh, Samir Jaja did. Everyone does mistakes. So this is a cardinal mistake which we all paid for. More importantly, political parties only know elections. This is very normal. But as individuals, we should not be obsessed with elections. Why vote for democracy when democracy doesn't exist? We want to talk about sovereignty and to regain the pillars of the state. Then we talk about uh, elections. If we win student elections in a couple of universities, this is a red herring. Don't go there. They want us to go for elections to claim that they represent the majority of the Shiites, the majority of the Sunnis, and to answer you uh, in conclusion, the Sunnis are nowhere to be found. And uh, Saad al-Hariri represents Hezbollah and doesn't represent the Sunnis with all due respect to the Sunnis of Lebanon. Sorry, you, so, can, can you talk a little bit about that, uh, the Sunni community and, and the leadership? The, the, Sunni, community. the Sunni community, the Sunni yeah. community start, start stopped stop defending uh, Saad al-Hariri. They still like him, and I like him as a person. He's a, he's a fun guy and everything. But he has taken us down a very dangerous road by his uh, the nexus that he established with Gibran Basile and all the corrupt business deals which were conducted under the auspices of Nadir, his, uh, his cousin. More importantly here, that uh, the, uh, the Sunnis of the regions, the peripheries, have been abandoned by the Gulf. Now we see a whole different 
ball game happening in the Tripoli and the north of Lebanon by the Turks and the Qataris trying to uh, to be visible, whereas the Emiratis do care about the Sunnis, but they're not willing to invest. We cannot talk about the Sunnis supporting anyone here in Lebanon as long as Saudi Arabia has stopped caring for Lebanon. The Saudis have an important role to play in getting this so-called Sunni giant to reawaken. All right. Thank you very much, Makram. But I still want an answer to the following question. Sorry, I keep like probing on this, but who, who, who can, who, um, what is the Sunni community's leadership today? Who is this leadership? Is it headless, completely headless? And what does that mean in terms of uh, when everything collapses and there's like a huge part of Lebanon that has no political leadership? What does that mean? Headless is not just the term, it's brainless in the sense that they believe that they can allow Hezbollah to control the government and they can give the one third veto power to Hezbollah and to Zuram Basil and get away with it. They cannot bankroll this economy on the five billion uh, loan that they supposedly want to get from the IMF. This is a sinking ship and any cargo which is put on this ship will sink down with this, with this, this no, non-existent ship, so to speak. Okay, so, but this brings me to the next, sorry, yeah, go ahead. If you, if you allow me, yes. uh, the, it's headless in the region, not just in Lebanon. Uh, look at, again, Syria and Iraq. Because the Gulf abandoned the, uh, the Sunni and the uh, majority of this region, uh, Turkey is playing a role, but they are playing it differently with supporting the Islamists. The Islamists will never uh, represent the majority of the Sunnis. That's why you find the Sunnis are you know, losing their, uh, their battle because they don't have anyone to represent them or to defend, defend what they really want in this region. So do you, are you it's saying- It's getting yeah. com very complicated now with, with the Biden administration so worried about the human rights in Saudi Arabia and in, and in Egypt and uh, uh, not mentioning the human rights in Lebanon or in Syria or in Iran even. They are not talking about it. And it's funny about election, Makram, they are uh, convincing the Syria, uh, Syrian people to, uh, go for elections and Bashar al-Assad after killing uh, uh, half a million Syrians, I want him to, to be defeated by elections. So is there, a, is there a concern, would there be a concern that Lebanon is going to become a battlefield like Syria is at one point where it will be Islamist extremists at one point, the Turkish, uh, uh, intervention like trying to fill the space uh, uh, the gap I mean, by the Saudis or maybe uh israeli strikes happening in lebanon as they are in syria uh, yes go ahead then. well uh, let me put on my historian hat i've studied the lebanese civil war uh, at the start of the war in 1975 everyone was investing here the ira were sending their people here we had the tigers of the tamil training here no one cares about Lebanon. No one will fund will, will even fund a soccer match between the Sunnis and the Shiites. This obsession that the civil war will destroy everything and then we can rebuild again with someone like Hariri and the Saudis saying, the world, this will never happen. The only way out of this, uh, this crisis is for us to admit that we have empowered a corrupt political class and they in turn have, have empowered Hassan Nasrullah and his band of killers. This is the only way out of this. A civil war will not happen. People will starve. No, no, people, no. Will, people will. Not a civil people. war, but like a battlefield kind of. Uh... Battlefield between between who? Between who? Hezbollah keeps on beating people up and uses the Lebanese army sometimes and the security apparatus another time. There is no battlefield. The battlefield is in people's fridges and in the empty shelves of the pharmacy and potentially in a number of institutions that will close. In 1975, we had over 70 daily newspapers. People were pumping money into Lebanon. Now, no one is pumping money. Everyone is pumping money out of Lebanon. Don't you see, do you, so you're saying that there will be no uh, confrontation between Iran and Israel in Lebanon anymore? 
This well, is- it's happening. It's happening in Syria, and uh, the Israeli Air Force is surgically uh, killing these people. And ultimately, the Democrats want to be obsessed with just putting the Gulfis uh, in line with human rights. What about human rights in uh, in Syria? What about human rights uh, in Yemen? The Houthis are going after everyone. What about human rights in Iraq when gunning down Hisham al Hashimi? This is where people, there's no, there's no difference between a Sunni killer and a Shiite killer and even a Baha'i killer. Everyone killed should be held accountable. That's important for any administration, be it Bernie Sanders who runs uh, the White House or Biden or Kamala Harris or everyone. Kamala Harris actually called Bashar al-Assad a dictator. And these red lines should be enforced. I'm not talking about going to war every time anything happens, but you cannot back away from the fight. The stick and the carrot should always be on the table. Okay, so I'm going to summarize the rest of the questions and ask you to do your concluding remarks and answer some of them. So one main question is, Makram, you said like a way out is to admit, but that's not really a way out. Like this is the first step in the way out. What is really the way out? Like really, what 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 should be done in Lebanon today? And this brings me to the second question that I asked earlier. Uh, is Does that mean a way out in Lebanon should be part of a policy that is a regional policy? Lebanon should be part of an Iran policy or should we dissociate Lebanon's policy from Iran's policy? Uh, and while thinking of this way out that I would like you all to, to talk about, like what is the, the solution for, for Lebanon today and how can the international community and the Biden's administration uh, play a role? So what is the what are the tools and how to uh, uh, resolve the situation before Lebanon officially becomes a failed state and total chaos? Uh, uh, happens so uh let's let's start uh with with uh, alia ali and and then makram finally hey. reverse order alia hey. uh, let me uh first comment in what has been said by my two colleagues uh, i'd like to say that the whole region is destroyed there is no shia victory and a defeat for the Sunnis, uh, the uh, Shia and the uh, Sunnis uh, are uh, destroyed. Uh, so there is no win and lose here. Uh, there is a comprehensive destruction that is reaching out to all communities in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and even within Iran. I want to say that for uh, Lebanon, all the solutions uh, are uh, are based on one point, which is uh, resolving the key uh, dilemma, which is the uh, a state within a state uh, and the uh, legal weapons and the illegal weapons. Not addressing this uh, issue will uh, not lead us to any solution. We cannot have uh, elections or uh, political settlements. They will not lead us anywhere because uh, the structure of the uh, state is uh, problematic uh, and we have to admit uh, that uh, the uh, influence of uh, Hezbollah in uh, uh, Lebanon is not because of the uh, power of Hezbollah itself. Uh, it is not the uh, self-power. It is because of the Iranian influence and role. And therefore we need to separate Hezbollah from uh, Iran and we need to address uh, that and the key point here and it's it's a contentious uh, point the key point is to resolve the problem of the illegal weapons in lebanon or the state within a state uh, just to summarize there for the people who are on live stream uh ali saying that the whole region not just lebanon is collapsing so this is something that we should look at like lebanon is part of the whole region so uh, we shouldn't separate the two things lebanon from the iran policy uh because every single solution in lebanon every single way out of lebanon will always face one main hindrance that is hezbollah's illegal arms the iranian arms in lebanon and this is the main question. If we do not solve the uh, state within the state problem, and if we do not really resolve the Hezbollah arms issue in Lebanon, there will be no way out. 
it's very simple. So I'm saying no, no dissociation in the two uh, uh, policies. Um, Alia? Yes, I don't believe uh, uh, there will be any solution for Lebanon without the region. And uh, about what can we do? Uh, it's difficult, but we are waiting now for the Biden administration and the nuclear deal, uh, the new uh, nuclear deal. And uh, honestly, we are not hearing anything about uh, uh, talking with the Iranians about their role in the region. Uh, they are repeating the same uh, like Obama did. It's about the nuclear issue. It's about uh, the Israeli and the missiles, but not about the region and the role the Iranians are playing. Maybe what can we do is to, uh, politically speaking, to create a, a, a group of uh, a lobby in, in, in DC or in, uh, in America to, to start yeah, focusing on our issues, it's not the nuclear. I don't care if, the, of course, I care if the Iranians have a nuclear weapon, but I, I do care about the Iranians' militia in Syria and in Lebanon and in Iraq. They are threatening, threatening me much more than uh, the nuclear issue. Yeah, I if think I, if... the operations, Iran's operations in the region is something that this administration is addressing. I I, I believe it's that. Uh... And no, no one should believe that the Russians will kick the Iranians out. Please, after you know, they promised this in 2015, and they gave them the rest of Syria. And some people are still waiting for the Russians to kick the Iranians. It yeah. will not work like this. Okay, uh, Makram, last word yes. for you. Uh, if I may, uh, this is not really uh, this com that complex. The problem in Lebanon is simply that no one is playing by the rules. We have a constitution. It's not a perfect constitution, but it was working as long as people admitted that it existed. The problem is the fact it's not the sectarian system. If you play by any rule, even though it's bad, okay, if you keep on doing and, and abusing it in a way that it does not collapse, it could work. The issue is here that you should continue sanctioning these people. These people are really scared by the US. They're really scared by sanctions. And they really like uh, uh, Macron. Look at Macron. Macron uh, has been, they spat in his face. They made fun of him. He came as a hero and left as a defeated, uh, a defeated conqueror. He's like the modern day Napoleon. Okay? He keeps on talking the talk, but he does not walk the walk. He should both talk the talk and walk the walk. The issue is not about what will Lebanon give the United States. The United States simply should not care about Lebanon, but should care about the fact, go ahead with the nuclear deal. The nuclear deal has to be enforced, but we have other problems. We have the ballistic missiles. And more importantly, we have the problem of Iran's behavior in the region. And it's not about the behavior of only shooting people. It's about making life impossible for us. It's by making everyone a Khashoggi and everyone a Luqman Slim. And this is your personal responsibility that for any diplomat who wants to come to Lebanon, pass by David Schenker at the Washington Institute and let him tell you how you should deal with these diplomats, how to deal with these Lebanese political elite. These people are liars. They are the people that ask for demar demarcation talks and then they weasel out. We have oil in the sea. This should not be accessed as long as we don't bring back the judiciary and ultimately put people in jail. Hezbollah cannot survive without the Jibran Basil and these people to uh, defend him and to convince people that the only way out for the Christians of the Levant is that this stupid alliance of minorities, which is so bad that I think it's an existential threat to anyone who believes that Jibran Basil and Bashar al-Assad and this band of killers can actually protect them. Thank you. All right. Um, I think I covered all the questions and I think you covered my questions. Unless you have anything else to say, uh, we can uh, we can conclude. But before that, I just want to say two things that um, things are happening in Lebanon very fast. 
and there isn't a good option for Hezbollah so far. Their only hope of a quick relief is now no longer uh, an option. Their option is really between losing the support of the people, losing the access to institutions, or losing control. And this is something that needs to be leveraged. Uh, Lebanon is not a fail, it's not bankrupt really, like the, the resources are there, you don't need to bail out Lebanon. I think the most important thing today really is to uh, enforce reforms, enforce a political solution, a real political solution, and then Lebanon's economy will, will be revived on its own. It doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really need much. Uh, I think the speakers have already highlighted these things. Um, I would like to thank you all. Uh, I know it's late in Beirut now, so I would love I will, I will let you go. Uh, it's uh, probably around your um, at night time. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you for the speakers for your amazing insights. Uh, and and please be careful. Uh, stay in touch and uh, uh, and let me know if you need anything. Uh, thank you very much. And um, have a good day.